unfortunately, they are disappearing from Puget Sound. But there's a growing and collaborative movement to conserve and restore kelp forests in our waters. So hi, I'm Gray. It's lovely to meet you all this evening. I'm the Kelp and Oyster Program Specialist at Puget Sound Restoration Fund. That's me in the brown t-shirt with some of my colleagues here, and I'll introduce the whole kelp team a little later on. I've been at PSRF for the last three years. I studied marine science in undergrad, worked for a number of years as a lab tech, as a tall ship sailor, um, an environmental educator, and lots of other marine adjacent things with, with connection to marine waters being the through line. And I really fell in love with the Salish Sea uh, while working aboard the Schooner Adventurous and taking classes at Friday Harbor Labs. And I knew this was my place and I feel very lucky that I get to work every day on the stewardship of of this place. So tonight we're going to talk about kelp forests. We'll start by building some background knowledge, you know, what is kelp, what are kelp forests. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on with kelp forests in Puget Sound here. We'll talk about what's being done about that and then for the last section we'll try to predict the future a little bit and tell you what I think's on the horizon for kelp. So let's get into the background. What are kelp forests? Well, I think the first question is, what is kelp? Um, kelp is a brown macroalgae, so they have brown photosynthetic pigments. That's how taxonomists group these types of macroalgae. Macroalgae just being algae that's big enough to see with our eyes. And typically, we think about kelp as being those species of brown macroalgae that belong to the specific order laminarials. And here's a couple of common understory kelp species we have here in Washington. We've got our three rib kelp, broad rib kelp, five rib kelp, lots of ribs, kelp, uh, and then sugar kelp as well, which is a very common species here. And I think it's equally important to introduce what is not kelp. Sometimes the word kelp gets thrown around like the word seaweed, and it's in fact a, a more specific term. So there are some types of brown macroalgae that we typically don't think of and are not referring to when we say the word kelp. For, for example, sargassum, this is a brown uh, macroalgae that we have here, and it's actually invasive in Washington waters. And then there's other macroalgaes with different photosynthetic pigments that make them green or red, and those are also not what we mean when we're talking about kelp. And then there's other marine vegetation as well. Um, this here is our native eelgrass at the bottom. So all of those beautiful forms of marine vegetation are not kelp, so they're not why we're here tonight. But we do have 22 different species of kelp in Washington waters. This is a poster that I love very much, designed by the artist Andrea Dingledane. You can buy it from her website if you want some awesome kelp art for your walls. And you can see that there's a lot of variety and diversity in the kelp form and shape and structure. And all of those different structures contribute to what we might think about as the kelp forest. So I'll introduce a few terms here and um, they're, they're sort of related to words that we might use to describe a terrestrial forest. So we've got our floating kelp species, bull kelp and giant kelp, which is brought up to the surface by gas-filled bladders and, and bulbs, and that forms the canopy structure. Then we've got our stipate or stipitate kelps that we consider the subcanopy. They have a little bit of stature off the sea floor and often sort of a, a woody stock. Uh, and then we have our understory kelps, which we have also, you might hear referred to as prostrate kelps. They're lying on the sea floor, sort of swishing back and forth, providing some shade for the benthos. Um, and, and that's sort of what our kelp forest looks like here. And the really key part is the canopy. And in Puget Sound proper, so south of Admiralty Inlet, the only canopy forming species that we have is bull kelp. We do have giant kelp out on the coast and the strait, but our forest former here in Puget Sound is the bull kelp. So I'll introduce you to my friend the bull kelp here. Um, when you close your eyes and think about bull kelp, that the big, large plant-like thing that you're imagining is the sporophyte. So the sporophyte is just one part of the life cycle, and I'll talk more about the life cycle in a moment. But the sporophyte will will start at the we start at the base down here. They have a holdfast, which um, is a sort of root-like structure. It's not the same as a plant root in that it doesn't have a special role in uptaking nutrients. But what it does is it hold kelp holds uh, the kelp in place on the substrate so that it can be in fast-moving, nutrient-rich waters um, and not you know just get ripped away. Then up from the holdfast we have the stipe. 
that terminates in a gas-filled bulb. The bulb will keep the blades afloat and towards the surface so that it can get all of that photosynthesizing done. These blades grow out like conveyor belts from the bulb, and once the kelp is reproductively mature, it'll start forming these dark patches of sorus material, which is little patches that are filled with spores, and those will slough off into the water. And we'll, go th we'll revisit the whole life cycle a little later on when it's more relevant. The scientific name for bull kelp is Neriosis Lewickiana. So if you hear somebody like me, for example, by accident during this talk later say Neriosis, I'm referring to bull kelp. All right, so why do we value kelp forests? Well, kelp forests create habitat structure. These stipes that grow through the water mitigate the flow. They slow down the, the laminar flow, and that helps trap nutrients, and it also creates a, a structure that provide shelter for a number of different important species here. This is a photo of black rockfish that I took out at Nia Bay last summer. Rockfish are just one of the important species that we commonly find associated with kelp habitat structure. Also salmon, lots of forage fish, and of course all of those form the basis of the diets for our beloved orca whales. And kelp is not only the structural foundation of the kelp forest ecosystem, it's also the energetic foundation. So kelp is a primary producer. It's photosynthesizing rapidly, cycling carbon and nutrients from, you know, taking the CO2 uh, nutrients from the water column and forming its own tissue, which then enters the food web. And it's very, very good at doing this. It's highly productive. It can grow up to 10 inches a day. Bull kelp is an annual species, so in the spring and summer, it's really shooting up fast to make it up to the surface. And that really rapid nutrient transfer and turnover makes it super productive. And that, of course, supports a diverse food web. Lots of stuff eats kelp, um, both while it's alive, uh, like you can see our kelp crab here. This is a really common grazer in Puget Sound, as is the kelp isopod on the left, um, as well as as it starts to senesce at the end of the season, all of that detrital material supports a whole detrital food web as well. Now, any beachgoer in Puget Sound is probably familiar with the site, or hopefully familiar with the site of bull kelp rack in the winter. Um, as the winter storms and then sort of start to wash the kelp up onto the beach, it uh, begins to degrade and it connects the terrestrial and marine system. So all of that carbon that the kelp sequestered or, or uptook from the marine environment then moves onto the beach where it gets broken down by bugs and other stuff that eats it and then those get eaten by birds and so on and so forth. So kelp is this beautiful connector of the marine and terrestrial systems. Another cool feature of kelp, um, another service that we, th we think it uh, offers um, as a photosynthesizer is altering the local water chemistry. So you may have heard of ocean acidification, which is the process by which excess CO2 in the water makes um, the ocean uh, a little bit more acidic, lowers the pH. Um, and kelp actually by uptaking that CO2 while it's rapidly photosynthesizing can help raise that pH a little bit. And that's really critical because all of our friends who make calcified shells really need higher pH water to be able to do that. So for here, for example, is a pinto abalone, um, and that's just one calcifier. Any, basically any shellfish you can think of in the water needs, needs a higher pH to be able to form its shell properly. I'll say that the science is still nascent there, so we're still, still understanding to what extent this potential refuge is occurring, but it's a cool feature of kelp. And then, of course, humans are part of these ecosystems, and kelp has social and cultural value for Washington and Coast Salish tribes in particular. Over here on the left is the Maiden of Deception Pass, who has beautiful bull kelp for her hair, and that's a Samish Indian Nation story. If you haven't had the chance to take a visit up to Deception Pass, I highly recommend it. You'll see some beautiful kelp forests, and you can read this story for yourself. It's also used and has been used in tool making and basket weaving. This is a um, macaw made kelp basket. And then it's part of many indigenous food ways. So herring will spawn on the surface of kelp blades and then the, the herring row can be collected from those kelp blades. It's also used to line cooking pits, to wrap fish in before they cook, and so on and so forth. 
And then kelp forests are sites for recreation for shoreline communities. They're really popular places to go spearfishing and free diving, to go scuba diving, to go kayaking around, boating, and even just walking along the shoreline or the beach and getting to see the abundant kelp forest. Now I do wanna take a moment to address the kelp carbon story since as KUOW said about a month ago, kelp is really having a moment and many of you may have heard that kelp is gonna be the silver bullet and solve climate change and we're all good, check that box. <laughs> but in fact, the story is a little bit more complicated than that. So kelp does of course take up carbon as a photosynthesizer, but it supports a complex, complex ecosystem with lots of organisms that are respiring CO2 and the, the meaning of sequestration can be a little tricky to pin down to try and figure out if the carbon that kelp is taking up is being sequestered for a biologically or geologically significant time period. So I just want to exercise a little bit of caution as a huge kelp fan myself in thinking that kelp is going to solve every single problem about carbon um, because the science there is just still uncertain, is still, still being researched. However, for all of those reasons we just discussed, kelp does yield a net positive impact on near, near shore ecosystems and so kelp conservation and recovery is highly likely to do the same. So bringing it all back together, what are some of the reasons that we value kelp forests? Well, they create a habitat structure. As primary producers, they cycle carbon and nutrients, are highly productive, support a diverse food web. They connect terrestrial and marine systems alter local water chemistry in hopefully a good way for calcifying organisms, and they have lots of social and cultural and recreational value for tribes and shoreline communities. So let's talk a little bit now about what is happening with our kelp forests. Well, kelp forests are declining in Puget Sound. As you may have guessed, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you about them if they were not. I wouldn't be employed doing this work if everything was hunky-dory with our kelp forests. Um, so let's dive into a little bit of what is going on here. Now, the most dramatic losses are occurring in the South Puget Sound. Um, Research by the Washington State Department of Natural Resources has documented an almost two-thirds decline in canopy kelp area in the South Sound um, since the earliest records from the 1870s. And here's a map of what that decline looks like and where it's occurring. So areas in the color corresponds to the most recent time that kelp was observed in that area. So areas in green or the most recently observed, whereas areas in darker purple are from the, the earliest time period, so the 1860s through the 80s. And you can see there's a lot of purple on this map. There is still some kelp that hangs out around Tacoma Narrows that we see come back year to year. And there has been this bed around Squaxin Island for many years, although that bed in, around Squaxin Island is really really in peril right now. Around Central Sound, the data that we have is a lot more anecdotal, but we can say for sure that all the kelp forests around Bainbridge Island have disappeared entirely. Your neighbors just to the north. The last one to disappear was the bed um, off of Wing Point, right where the ferry turns in, and that stopped showing up as of about 2017. What about Vashon Island? Well, I uh, tried to do a dive for information and I didn't really come up with very much. The only data set I could get my hands on was from 2000 and this is a DNR data set. So areas in orange on this map show kelp presence as of the year 2000. Just from chatting with folks, I, I know that there is still a kelp forest at the north end and this one at the northeast end is still present. And I've heard that the kelp forest at the south end is there but maybe, um, uh, less robust than it used to be. And then I've heard mixed, mixed reports about what's going on in Colvos Pass. So all that to say, I'd love to hear from folks during the discussion or afterwards if you feel like sharing what you've observed about these kelp forests um, around your island recently. Now I do wanna say that it's not all doom and gloom for all of Washington waters. Kelp decline is patchy across the wider region. So this is a map from the Washington Kelp Canopy Indicator Project, which is led by DNR and the Northwest Straits Commission. And it's part of an effort to create canopy kelp as a vital sign for tracking the health of Puget Sound. 
So the map is divided uh, into sub-basins that are shaded according to the status of canopy kelp in each sub-basin. So as I just talked about in South and Central Sound, we are seeing a decline, but there are other regions where that's not the same story. There's concern for decline in the Saratoga and Whidbey basins and in the San Juans as well. Samish Indian Nation has done a very cool project synthesizing traditional ecological knowledge and modern aerial imagery and drone imagery uh, to assess what's going on with the kelp forests in their waters up there. And they have, have documented some decline. There's a really awesome story map that I encourage folks to Google and check out um, uh, for, to see what's going on with the San Juans and what the Samish are observing. And then you can see in the North Coast and the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the there's not so much concern for decline. Now, these are really dynamic systems. They're annual. The kelp beds prop, prop up you know, most vigorously in the summer. So it can be difficult to track what really is going on in terms of long-term trends. But all the data that we have suggests that the kelp at the north coast and through the strait is doing all right, which is good news. So what's driving this kelp decline? Well. We aren't sure. It's a complicated story, and there's a lot of research going on right now to try to untangle what's happening. Um, but there's a number of different things that are likely playing into this decline. So temperature in the category of what we might think about as physical stressors is, is for sure a problem. There's been recent research by Brooke Weigel and Robin Fales at, up at the UW Friday Harbor Labs showing that in laboratory experiments, kelp really does fail to perform at high temperatures, temperatures that we do observe in the summer in South and, and sometimes Central Sound. So that's certainly a problem. Now there's other things that are also likely causing decline or at least presenting a stressor for our kelp. Um, sedimentation, so scouring of the seafloor can disturb the newly settled spores. Anything that creates cloudiness in the water column or turbidity as we call it is going to block light and that's gonna be a huge problem of course for our photosynthetic kelp. And then there's nutrient imbalances that can be too many nutrients, too few um, that, that make it hard for kelp to get what they need from the water. Now there's also this category of biological stressors that may be occurring, and we have um, not a lot of information about this yet. So if folks are, have heard of the, the kelp restoration and, and decline story of California, you'll be familiar with the sort of classic trophic ecology example of sea otters getting you know, all hunted by us and disappearing. And then those sea otters weren't able to eat all of the sea urchins, so urchin populations explode, and then you have urchin barrens. And so when, when folks from California say kelp restoration, they usually just mean smashing urchins with various size hammers, et cetera. <laughs> and we don't seem to have that problem right now in Puget Sound. We don't commonly see big urchin barrens in Puget Sound. Um, we do have urchins, but it's not, not the same story. Uh, and it's possible that one of our other grazers, for example, kelp crabs, is out of balance, but we just don't have enough long-term data to be able to say for sure if that's going on. I also mentioned the presence of sargassum in Washington waters. That's an invasive species, and that's maybe inhibiting um, kelp growth as well. And then, of course, none of these stressors is happening in a vacuum in these complex systems. All of these things are interacting. So, for example, there was recent research that came out that some species of kelp struggle to respond to thermal stress in low light conditions. So what that means is if water quality is bad, then that's going to make it a lot harder for kelp to deal with our heating up water. And all of these things interact and untangling them is a, is a complex um, problem. So, yeah. In to wrap that up, what's driving kelp decline? Well, we're not totally sure. Temperature is definitely a problem. Sedimentation, low nutrient availability, and trophic imbalances may also be at play. I'm just gonna take a quick water break. All right, so that's sort of the doom and gloom portion, and <laughs> we're through that now, and I get to talk about what's being done about it. So there's a network of nonprofits and state and federal agencies, tribes, researchers, community groups, and more that are working collaboratively to advance kelp conservation and recovery in Washington state. And I want to mention this document that came together in 
2020, uh, this kelp conservation and recovery plan, because it really synthesized this shared vision amongst lots of different groups for thriving kelp forests in Puget Sound. Um, excuse me. This document really helps guide our work at PSRF and it helps synchronize the wider working sphere of, of kelp practitioners around Puget Sound, um, around some common goals. This is also an awesome document to give a quick read through if you're interested in doing a real deep dive. So I'll talk a little bit about what we are working on at Puget Sound Restoration Fund to advance kelp recovery. So our goal is to reverse declines of Puget Sound kelp forests and to develop solutions to rebuild the essential habitat that kelp forests provide. And now I'll introduce you to the rest of the kelp team. You know me already. Um, Brian Allen is our restoration director. Hillary Hayford is our research director. And Jesse Florendo is our program coordinator. Um, and they're a great team and I love working with them. And we also work on oyster restoration as well. And I realized far too late that all of the pictures of our team for this talk were of us doing oyster work. But I promise we also do kelp work. <laughs> okay. So the conservation and recovery plan that I just mentioned identified six strategic goals, and I'm gonna use these to help contextualize our program and our work within the wider sphere of kelp work going on in the region. So the goals are to reduce stressors, improve understanding of the value of kelp to Puget Sound ecosystems and integrate those into management, to describe kelp distributions and trends, designate protected areas, restore kelp forests, promote awareness, engagement, and action from user groups, tribes, the public, and decision makers. So kelp restoration is severely limited by information here in Puget Sound. Kelp is really having a moment now, but it's sort of just gotten onto the scene in the last decade uh, in terms of having a broader coalition of folks working towards its conservation and recovery. And what that means is we don't have a lot of historical data sets telling us what's been going on for a long time period here. So that presents a huge problem for restoration. So the first arm of our program that I'm gonna talk about aims at these goals two and three here of improving the understanding of value of kelp to Puget Sound ecosystems and describing kelp trends. And we have launched this Eyes on Kelp initiative, which is a network of index sites that span a range of kelp conditions throughout the Southern Salish Sea. Um, and some of these sites uh, for kelp monitoring are places where there's a robust kelp forest that comes back year to year. Some of these sites are places where we know kelp is declining in recent years. Some of these places have already lost their kelp forest. This work is being funded by the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. And you may be wondering how that team of but four people that I showed you a few slides ago is covering this huge spatial gradient. And that's because we're doing it in partnership with a number of organizations. And I do wanna share all their names here. So Reef Check Washington is a really important partner. We're also working with the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe, the Lower Elwha Klalem Tribe, the Macaw Tribe, Marine Geo, Northwest Straits Commission, NOAA Fisheries, the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium, Port of Seattle, the Samish Indian Nation, Seattle Aquarium, the Squaxin Island Tribe, the Suquamish Tribe, the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Labs, the USGS, the State Legislature, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Natural Resources, and Washington Sea Grant. And I'm sorry for reading you that long list, but I think it's really important to name everybody that we are working with. Um, so what's going on at these monitoring sites? you might be thinking, well, we've got paired environmental monitoring buoys with, with instrument arrays that are deployed and continuously collecting data on a number of different parameters. Um, and those are paired with annual scuba surveys where we are doing biodiversity monitoring. So these continuously logging buoys that we've got out now, we have three of them deployed already. Um, and they look like this. They're a big yellow buoy. They say research on the side. There is one at Wing Point, and so if you take the Bainbridge Ferry and you look out, you can see it, and you can wave to it and be like, great, great put you there. Um, <laughs> and anyways, so back to what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> we've got these instrument buoys with um, sensor packages about a meter below the surface and a meter above the sea floor, and that is gonna enable us to capture what the water conditions are like for the kelp canopy when it's up at the surface at the summer and for the juveniles and alternate life stage when they are down towards the sea floor. 
and we are monitoring temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, salinity, and light, and having information about these parameters across a big spatial gradient is going to really help us understand the range of conditions in which kelp forests are occurring in the Southern Salish Sea. So yeah, there's the diagram and then there's also uh, Jackie in the water helping us install a buoy. Now we've also got not only environmental monitoring but biodiversity surveys that happen at each site each summer when the kelp is sort of in peak form. Um, and to do these surveys, we have brought up Reef Check, which is an awesome, huge nonprofit that trains community science divers all over the world to conduct really scientifically rigorous and robust surveys um, of, of reefs and of kelp forests. There, there's a big program in California, uh, lately a, a program in Oregon that launched in the last couple of years, and then just in 2022, Reef Check Washington um, launched and it's very very exciting to be able to synchronize so many different efforts and so many different dive teams around a common protocol and collect a really robust data set and this is just the beginning of that so for these biodiversity surveys we are looking at uh, 29 indicator species of fish 26 species of invertebrates, 13 different species of macroalgae, and then our primary space holders, which is UPC, is just the nickname for that survey style. And like I was saying, because this same, the protocol, you know, is customized, of course, for Washington waters, because what we have here looks really different than what we've got even out on the coast or, or in Oregon or California. But because we're using uh, similarly structured surveys, we can compare our systems here to those in other locations. 2022 was their first uh, year of training and we, yeah, and, and so they were able to train 31 uh, community science divers and some crossover divers from other regions as well. And then what's really exciting for me is that we can get lots of partnership, professional scientific dive teams in on this survey, collecting the same type of data using the same method. So of course, PSRF is the dive team, me and Brian, uh, are, are using these reef check surveys, and so is the DNR dive team, the Samish Indian Nations dive team. We had a, a, a class at Friday Harbor Labs implement this uh, this summer. Point Defined Zoo and Aquarium's got a team doing these protocols, and there's a lab at UW who's doing these as well. And the reef check surveys happen at an even wider range of sites than just our bio, than just those that have the paired instrument monitoring sites. So this is a map of all of the sites reef check divers surveyed in 2022. All of those in green were surveyed by um, community science divers, which is which represents a huge amount of work. This is like typically, um, you know, a, a team of divers in the water for like two full days to get this work done. So that but times 22 and, you know, <laughs> taking ferries and driving hundreds of miles to get to all these places. So a really huge body of work. Um, and then the other 12 blue sites were done by those partner groups that I was just mentioning. So with the index sites, what we're hoping to achieve is the cataloging of existing natural resources. So what species do we have? Where, um, what do these communities look like? We can start to define the environmental ranges. So as you know, South Sound water is really different from the water up in the strait, but we do have kelp forests occurring across that whole range. So what are the range of conditions across which we know kelp to occur? We can begin to detect and interpret change. And this is a huge advantage of consistent long-term monitoring. We can lay foundations for research, so it's hard to ask targeted, manipulative, experimental questions if you don't have a baseline knowledge of you know, what species are present, what are the common conditions that we're gonna find. Of course, it helps us inform our restoration practice. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like, but it's hard to know if you've done a good job creating a re restored kelp forest if you don't know what species you expect to see or what water conditions you expect to see. And then of course one of the major advantages or, or major pros of this program is that it allows us to con connect all of these regional kelp interests and synchronize a lot of different efforts um, around the same protocols and methods and goals and create these huge public data sets that are available for, for interested folks. All right, so now I'll talk a little bit about our restoration work specifically and what that looks like. So restoration is a, um, 
kind of vague word that can mean a lot of different things. Like I was mentioning earlier, kelp restoration to Californians means smashing lots of urchins. Um, that's not exactly what we, are, what we are taking on here in Puget Sound. Of course, kelp restoration can also mean mitigating physical stressors. And you know, while we're working to collectively understand what those stressors are and how they interact, what our team is working on at PSRF is population enhancement. So coming up with methods to reintroduce um, kelp forests in places where they have been lost. So as I threatened earlier, the kelp life cycle, we'll return to it now, the uh, macroscopic, the visible part of the life stage, that sporophyte, which gets growing in the early spring, reaches the surface and begins to be reproductive, releases these, starts to generate these sorus patches, the blades grow out rapidly like conveyor belts sloughing off these sorus patches, which sort of sink to the seafloor, and then they release these free-swimming zoospores. Those zoospores will turn into gametophytes, and the gametophytes are the, um, the males and the females, and they're the ones that are actually reproduce and to form the next generation of juvenile sporophytes. And all of this zoospore, gametophyte, juvenile sporophyte phase happens at the microscopic level, so we're not able to easily observe it in the wild. Um, and you know this happens on an annual basis, so our kelp really starts going in the spring and really starts to senesce in, in the late fall here, typically October, September in Central Sound. We do see farther out in the strait and on the coast, we'll get some kelp that'll hang out for the whole winter, but for the most part, it, it gets pretty uh, decimated and by the winter storms and so on and so forth. So how do we reintroduce these annual self-sustaining bull kelp forests in locations where they've disappeared using, and this is critical, scalable and feasible methods? And that's a primary focus of our program. And we have been dabbling in the kelp world for a while now, and the earliest attempts were, were done in 2010 when we tried transferring juvenile sporophytes from one site to another. We also tried collecting just the sorus patches and moving them um, from one site to another. And neither of those was very effective. They're both very time in, and labor intensive and we didn't really see the formation of an, a mature forest that we were hoping to see. We have also dabbled in the world of green gravel, which involves seeding gravel with kelp and then transferring it out into the field. So we took this on in 2012. We placed a bunch of gravel and mesh frames, cultured some kelp in it for a couple of days, and then transferred it to the field via boat. And nothing grew from that kelp trial. And what we also learned is that it's very difficult to move a significant quantity of gravel that's seeded with very del delicate juvenile kelp. <laughs> so. In recent years, we've borrowed this technique from kelp aquaculture of seeding twine. Um, we have done a lot of tinkering and trials as well to identify the optimal seasonal window and the optimal life stage to outplant in terms of creating a, a, a mature forest. And so here you can see some of our uh, spools of fine twine with those, the, all that little brown fuzz is very, very young um, kelp sporophytes. The microscope image on the left is uh, what the kelp sporophytes look like. They're, you know, like 50 to 100 cells each at that time. And then there's uh, Brian doing the sporulation. So we typically, for the past few years, have been using wild collected sorus material, which we can get from those plants that overwinter up, up north. And the cool thing about this twine is that once it's uh, seeded, it's very easy to move out into the field and put onto other surfaces. We don't have to move like hundreds of thousands of gravel pieces. So this is a great method to transfer seed from the uh, lab, from the aquaria into the field. And we've tried a couple of different substrates. Um, the first thing we tried was these big poured seed pyramid forms, we called them. And this was the first uh, time that we were able to grow kelp from seed all the way to reproductive maturity was on these seed pyramids. So that was really exciting. Um, but it's, uh, as you might imagine, very difficult to move around large, these huge concrete blocks. We had to have a crane vessel drop them into place. So we weren't really able to get the volume of mature adults that we wanted to see. So 
in, since 2021, we've been using cultivation lines to do that, which is also a technique that we're borrowing from kelp aquaculture. So we'll uh, um, anchor these, these big cultivation lines on either side and put lots of, of weight on them to help uh, resist all of the drag and buoyancy of the kelp. And then once we've got those in place, we can shuttle seeds along them. And I'm gonna show a little bit more about that process in a moment. And we've been working in particular um, at this site here, uh, just outside of the Docag Watts estuary off of Jefferson Head. So this is where a lot of our kelp enhancement work has gone on, the seeding um, with the twine that I've been talking about. And we have done this work with, um, with uh, in partnership with the Suquamish tribe. This is a location that used to have a big fishing bed. This is in Suquamish waters, and it used to be a, a place that was a big kelp bed that used to be a common place for fishing. And so some folks from the Suquamish tribe, you know, got in contact with us and were like, hey, can you try and, and do some kelp restoration work in the water here? So that's the, the, the site that we've really been testing all of our methods at for the last few years. So here's what shuttling that spool of seed along the cultivation line looks like. This is Brian in the water, and this would be happening in early Febu or late February, early March, when we really start to see the low tides occur during the daylight. That seems to be when the kelp really gets going. And then after a few months, starting in you know really June, the kelp has grown into a full-formed forest. And uh, so once it reaches the surface, we'll start monitoring it from snorkels and, and paddle boards. And you can see this is some of our outplanted kelp here with a beautiful reproductive sorus patch that's just like ready to drop and release all those sores, um, spores into the water. And yeah, I was hoping to be able to play a video, but I think it might not work. So instead, well, maybe. No, that's okay. So instead, I'll just talk you through what happens. Um, there is a video on our website of what this kelp seeding process looks like and sort of the whole life cycle of the outplant. And so if you want to get some more visuals, that's a great place to look. So just to go over again what we were talking about, in January, that's when we're collecting our wild saurus. We're seeding that twine in the lab. From February to March is when we are doing the seed outplanting. Then June through July, kelp hits the surface and starts to become reproductive. In September and October, we start to see the kelp senesce. And then the hope is that the following spring, all of that reproductive material that our outplanted kelp put into the water fosters a second generation. Now, we have not yet seen the second generation appear. The, we've done this for three years now, and the, this specific type of, of restoration trial where we're really getting kelp to reproductive maturity. And um, typically when we go back, we see a few sporophytes, um, but not a whole second forest. So a lot still to understand there. So what have our efforts achieved? Well, we're definitely creating seasonal habitat structure for fish. I dive at this site all year round and it's really cool to see the, all the different fish populations start to move in in the summer. You know, we're supporting food webs. We see our kelp crabs and all sorts of other critters start to move through the area once the kelp really gets growing. And of course the kelp by being there, by photosynthesizing is cycling carbons, carbon and nutrients. So these are the fish species that we observed in 2022. We saw buffalo, sculpin, and kelp perch, ling cod, pile perch, red irish sole, rock sole, shiner perch, tube snout, and over a thousand forage fish. So really exciting um, creation of fish habitat happening. It's quite possible that our kelp outplantings right now are, are improving local water chemistry, although we haven't been able to test that. And they also may be introducing propagules that are seeding areas nearby. As I said, we haven't seen the, the forest reappear in the area that we are outplanting, but it's possible that those, those spores are being transferred via currents to other locations. So that's possibility. And so, yeah, and we haven't yet successfully created a self-sustaining forest, so there's still a lot of work to do there and um, a lot of exciting projects on the horizon to try to get us towards that goal. 
So an, a critical element of our restoration efforts are, is our kelp lab and our gametophyte bank. So we've got um, a laboratory facility at our conservation hatchery, which is at NOAA Manchester at the research station there. And that's what makes it possible for us to research bull kelp propagation and genetics and other questions about Puget Sound kelps and macroalgae. Um, our kelp lab is really, you know, the springboard for our in-water projects. And we are also, as of 2023, housing a, a bull kelp seed bank or a gametophyte bank uh, at this facility. And we're doing that in partnership with a researcher um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, Dr. Philippe Alberto. And this bank is very much like a seed bank in that it houses reproductive material, it houses gametophytes from the majority of, from I think it's about 20 different um, kelp populations, distinct kelp populations in Puget Sound. So preserving that genetic material is really important so that we have it as kelp starts to be lost and so that we can research further questions about kelp genetics and try to understand, you know, what is the best population and genetic mix to be outplanting for restoration trials and so on. So lastly, um, you know, we do lots of promoting awareness and engagement and action from user groups, from tribes, the public, and decision makers. You know, that's what I'm doing here tonight, talking to you all, and thank you so much for coming and listening to me talk about kelp. And then, of course, our team works uh, closely with lots of different groups, participating in work groups and having lots of conferences and calls and events and meetings and so on, so that we all sort of stay synchronized on our, our goals of restoring and conserving kelp here. So just to review the elements of our program that I talked about, we have our big long-term monitoring initiative, the Eyes on Kelp program, which supports uh, goals two and three of the conservation and recovery plan, improving the understanding of kelp systems and describing trends. Our in-water enhancement trials and outplanting, the development of the kelp lab and the gametophyte bank all go towards supporting goal five of restoring kelp. And then of course, the outreach and network building and participation and so on are all going towards goal six. All right, so what's on the horizon for kelp? Well, I'll talk about some of the things on the horizon for us at PSRF. Um, what I think is on the horizon for the wider uh, kelp world in Washington, and then maybe what's on the horizon for you. So for PSRF, we have an exciting project that we're developing where we're doing a reciprocal transplant experiment in partnership with the Alberto Lab to look at fundamental questions about kelp genetics and local adaptation. And if you haven't heard of reciprocal transplant experiments before, essentially what they are is taking kelp from one population in one area and another population in a totally different area and picking them up, transplanting them essentially, or seeding, seeding with the population at the opposite site. And what that'll start to tell us is, you know, are kelps adapted for their hyper-specific location or um, is there, yeah, just like a wider diversity of genetics going on? So that'll be really cool for us to learn. We're also working with a lot of tribal partners to develop collaborative kelp restoration actions that are happening right now. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, the kelp bed off of Squaxin Island is um, rapidly declining and last, um, Last summer, only I think about a dozen um, plants came back, and that's a really important kelp bed for the Squaxin Island tribe. So we have been working with them to try to address that, and this this year we, we tested out an outplanting that just went out in the water a couple of weeks ago in that at that area to see if we can help regrow that kelp. Um, and we're also working on a seed banking project with the Jamestown Sklalem tribe and producing seed for cultivation for the Tulalip tribes. So lots of exciting uh, collaboration with our tribal partners and actions developing there. So what's going on in the wider kelp world? Well, this bill passed last year, uh, SB 5619, Conserving and Restoring Kelp Forests and Eelgrass Meadows in Washington State. And this bill depart directs the Department of Natural Resources 
excuse me, to create a statewide kelp forest and eelgrass meadow health and conservation plan. And the goal of that plan is to conserve and restore at least 10,000 acres of kelp forest and eelgrass meadow habitat by 2040. So a lot is going to happen <laughs> around that, that bill, and it'll be really interesting to see how we move forward and move towards that goal of 10,000 acres conserved by 2040. We also in Washington are seeing the continued development of the, the very nascent kelp farming industry. So there are two active kelp farms in Washington waters right now and many more in the permitting process. As restoration practitioners, we are pretty excited about the development of kelp aquaculture. As I discussed, a lot of the tools and techniques that we are using for restoration applications are things that we've borrowed directly from kelp aquaculture as an industry. So I think as the industry continues to develop, so too will the tools available for us to use as restoration practitioners. And then of course, kelp farming itself may also have lots of potential benefits, including creating habitat structure for fish um, and possibly being a seed source that bolsters wild populations. So a lot of exciting things happening in that world. And then what's on the horizon for you? Well, if this was your first introduction to the wild world of kelp, I hope you are feeling inspired to learn a little bit more. Um, you can check out our website, restorationfund.org. We have lots of videos, including that one that I didn't get to show you this evening, um, and many more, and links to our partners' websites. So there's a ton of excellent resources to dive into there. And then I hope you're also inspired to get involved and advocate for kelp in your sphere. And that'll look really different for every person. So if you're a shoreline property owner or any property owner, managing runoff and sedimentation, that can really help improve local water quality, which as we know is likely to help kelp deal with other stressors and reestablishing natural shorelines as well where possible. If you're a fisher or an educator or a parent or whatever your community group or sphere is, raising awareness for kelp is essential. You know, for a lot of people, these systems, you know, they're underwater, which I love, but for, for many people makes them inaccessible and they won't see them. So without folks talking to them about why kelp forests are important, they may never realize. So you have lots of influence in your own sphere. Um, if you're a voter or a constituent, of course, advocating for kelp conservation and restoration within your local government and to your elected officials is invaluable for advancing this type of work. You can always donate your time or money to various organizations working on kelp conservation and recovery. And then, of course, I think one of the most important things any of us can do in any ecosystem or to, to face any any degradation of habitat is to just pay attention. Um, pay attention to your local kelp forests over time because especially in data poor systems like kelp forests in Puget Sound where we don't have long histories of scientifically robust data to look on, the, the, the input from folks who know and love a place, who have been watching it for decades, for years, for generations, is totally invaluable in, in us understanding what's going on and what we can do about it. So pay attention, log your observations, collect photos, and if you are seeing decline of kelp forests in your waters, notify resource agencies so that actions can start to be taken towards, towards rectifying that. If you have this special skill of being a scuba diver and you're interested in getting involved in that way, you can become a reef check diver and learn how to do those surveys that I was describing. Um, Jackie of Reef Check is here this evening and she has a table outside so you can chat with her after the talk about getting involved. You do need to be a rescue diver and have some experience diving in Puget Sound, but um, yeah, talk to Jackie and she can, she can get you connected. And this is a really fun way to get to do lots of dives around all around Washington. So I highly encourage you, or if you know folks who are scuba divers who'd be interested to get, um, yeah, get trained with this program. So um, I'll wrap it up now. I hope we've all you know, been able to take away some of the ways in which kelp forests are a critical nearshore ecosystem in the Salish Sea. We know that they are disappearing from parts of Puget Sound, uh, but that there is a growing and collaborative movement to conserve and restore kelp forests in our waters. 
So thank you very much for listening to me talk for 50 minutes. I'm happy to take questions or comments, uh, and you can also always email me. I'm gray at Restoration Fund if you want to follow up on anything more. Okay, so thank you, that was great. We will take questions now for anybody who has them. Just raise your hand and Maria or I will bring you the microphone. Uh, I'm wondering about the gradient, temperature gradient at which bulk health or, or exists and whether or not there's been any experimentation with the reciprocal transplanting from warmer areas to like South Puget Sound. Yeah, so the question is about um, the temperature gradient across which bulk health exists and whether there's been any experiments transplanting from warmer waters to Puget Sound. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't really say that into the microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, so Great question. No, there has not been experimentation in that realm so far. I think right, n so right now, um, you can only move uh, kelp within Washington waters, so you can't take it from another state and bring it here without getting a lot of, um, I, I'm actually not even sure if you can get a permit for that. But so right now, the, the, the you can't move um, bull kelp from other places into Washington. Uh, so, and, and South Puget Sound is the warmest place in Washington. <laughs> but I do know that in other countries and with other species of kelp that that is a restoration approach that's being taken. So in Australia, I believe with uh, crayweed, which is their forest former, they've selected for heat tolerant strains and then use that in their transplants to restore kelp forests. So that is, is is something that's likely to be on the horizon. It's not work that's being done right now, but it's definitely a potential tool in the toolbox for responding to warming waters and climate change. Yeah, thanks for the question, that's great. We can pass bills, but who puts the money with the bills? Essentially, what is this costing? Oh, that's a great question, and I should have looked up how much our, <laughs> our things cost. Um, I mean, the legislature also puts the money with the bills, you know, so we do have funding from the legislature to do this work, and I'm sorry I don't have the numbers off the top of my head for what percentage of the funding from our projects is, is from the legislature, um, but I'm, I would love it if you send me an email about that so I can get you the right information and let you know. Yeah. Well, we all want projects done. Mm -hmm. We want our roads fixed, mm -hmm. but there's not enough money around. And right now, sitting on Bashan with property tax, don't come at us with more to restore the sound. We're doing our best. I have one other. Have you gotten any information about the uh, bull kelp belt that used to be just north of the Fauntleroy Ferry Dock? Um. Are you talking about, let me see if I can get back to that slide. It seemed to me, I don't, they also had to bring in this this one supplement. at the very tip here, the north, the one at the north end. No, it's on the font right side. Oh, on the. Oh, around Lincoln Park. Yeah. Great. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. forgot Lincoln Park. Um, yeah, that kelp forest is still there around Lincoln Park. That's that's still present. Um, and actually, you should ask Jackie, who's been in the water there more recently than me, what that looks like right now after the talk. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Greg. Good job. I Thanks. have, like, so many questions, but... <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm cur very curious about how we compare internationally. Um, you mentioned Australia is doing some things right now, but mm. ha in uh, California and Oregon. But are we? Is our kelp declining faster than other areas of international waters, or mm. are we on par? Yeah. Well, it's hard to make a big generalization. Um, I 
I know that there have been big losses in California, like almost total losses in some areas of California, but that some of those places are making a comeback thanks to some restoration efforts. Um, I don't have as, and I also know that in Australia, they experienced like really catastrophic loss of their kelp forest, which was part of why they, you know, sort of went gung-ho with this project that many people would consider kind of risky of doing genetic strain selection and outplanting heat tolerant kelp is because they really did lose um, a huge portion of their kelp forest and then all their fisheries crashed as happens. Um, so, you know, I'm, I think it's hard to say exactly how we stack up to other places. I think in South Sound it's pretty dire and Central Sound is, is also not great, although not quite as dire as, as South Sound. But then, you know, we do have robust kelp forests that are doing well out on the coast and in the strait. So yeah, it's hard to make a big comparison, but thank you. The question was about um, how we compare in Washington in terms of kelp decline to the rest of the world. Um, also, I, I live in that little, not on the north tip of Ashon, but down by Glen Acres, Dilworth, which is the northeast side, yeah, and been monitoring that, or not monitoring, but aware of the kelp forest that's come and gone, mm -hmm. and recently coming back, which is great. But cool, I'm happy to share more information on that. Um, great. Yeah, I was confused a little bit, or, or maybe not clear. Um, when the kelp regrows, yes, from uh, do the holdfasts regrow kelp from prior years or is it just the I can't remember the name neo something or other yes um, no I know you I'm all learned do, <laughs> do the whole fast also just regrow or are they dependent on the spores coming down and, and yeah so the hold fasts do not regrow they typically you know when they're part of the sporophyte and when the sporophyte's done so is the hold fast sometimes and then so, so yeah, so nothing really, once, yeah, and, and once it's sort of like chopped in half or something like that, like once kelp crabs come and snip off the bulb, it's not happen. It's not really happening anymore. So when they're really little, the growth is happening more towards the base of the stipe or throughout the stipe. And then once they get to a certain point, there's a, what's called a meristem switch where the point of growth starts to become like the crown of the bulb and the base of the blades. And that's where all the growth is, ha growth is happening. So if, as is really common, if you like spend some time in the water in the late summer here, you'll see what looks just like a floor of cables where kelp crabs have come up and snipped off the bulbs and there's just the stipes <laughs> laying on the ground and that's like game over, they're not coming back from that. So then you'll just have the next generation of sporophytes. In some places where um, the substrate is actually sandier, we usually see kelp on like big boulders, rocks, maybe unconsolidated cobbles here in the sound. But in some places where it's really sandy, actually the holdfast will like stick around for multi-generations and they're not really like living anymore, but they are providing a surface that the next generation of kelp settles on. It's very weird. I've only seen it happen at like a few sites. So sometimes the holdfasts do stick around, but not as like a growing functional um, individual kelp. Interesting. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a scuba diver, and cool. out front there are there's rocky substrate where the kelp grows, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of sand. And mm -hmm. I've never seen a holdfast in the sand. But yeah, I know, but there are places where it's happening, and it's like eelgrass beds and kelp beds occurring in the same sandy location. It's wild. Thank you for your questions. Prior I, to me being a scuba diver, I remember uh, kelp growing in that area. So maybe maybe in the past it did. It's not there, mm -hmm. now, but. Yeah. I hope it comes back. <laughs> yeah, well, me too. Whatever I can do to help from there. Thank you. Yes, on the, on the water quality side, uh, do you do any samplings in healthy areas as well as lost areas for pharmaceuticals and pesticides? Mm. Yeah, so our team does not monitor water quality in terms of pollutants. Um, I, Department of Ecology typically does, and they have lots of public data sets about that. Um, I know that some things in particular are really harmful for kelp, like a lot of heavy metals like copper will inhibit kelp growth. So if any of those are present in the water, that can be a problem. And I'm sure that's the case in a lot of Puget Sound. Um, 
I don't have like a data set, you know, on hand right now about what those water pollutant qualities look like for Puget Sound versus maybe out in the strait. Although I think we can make some educated guesses based on the urban relative urbanization of the shorelines that we're seeing mm -hmm. a lot more of those pollutants in, in sound in central and south sound and those are certainly a, a contributor to stress on kelp. Yeah. That's the, your, your healthier areas seem to be where the people aren't. Yeah, I mean, not totally in that the Seattle waterfront is actually f mysteriously full of kelp. Like, all along Elliott Bay and Centennial Park is it has, like, a lot of kelp that has been uh, really cropping up a lot in the last couple of years. So, uh, yeah, so not entirely. <laughs> it's, it's sort of mysterious. Um, and I, th I think... Yeah, and I could make some guesses as to why, but maybe I shouldn't make too many wild guesses here. Um, yeah. A number of years ago now, I uh, spent my New Year's Eve and New Year's Day at the site that I see that you have up there just on the Squamish Reservation, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the recipient of the uh, Foss oil spill out of March Point. Mm, so yeah. I'm just curious as to how, how an oil spill of that magnitude affects uh, the possibility. Apparently, we're going back now probably about 18 years. So, uh, so there, is, that, is that kelp healthy now? And, or has there been any impact from that oil spill? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't, so the question is about the oil spill at March's Point near Jefferson Head where our kelp enhancement trial is, I think that's, what, or where the one site is. Up at March's Point, is that the one by Fidalgo? Well, March Point is across the lake, but that, it, it blew across that lake. Mm. Do you know how it's getting, uh, by the time we got there, it was mostly on the beach. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can't, s I don't know what the effect was. I'm sure that oil spills are problematic for kelp in a number of ways and that the, pol the, the chemicals in the oil are, are problematic for kelp growth. Um, I don't know exactly what the effect was, but that's really interesting and I will, I will look into it. Thank you for your question. Yeah, it was on a New Year's Eve, so I don't know whether that was maybe uh, part of a life lesson. Yeah, so... Actually, uh, I, I didn't even tell you all, but there is a little bit of a mystery of the kelp life cycle of we don't, because these are microscopic life stages, we actually don't know when exactly they turn from spores to gametophytes and when reproduction actually happens. Uh, so it, any of those microscopic life stages might be present, and I would imagine a slick of oil settling on any of them would be a huge problem. So definitely what happens in the winter is a prob can, can be a problem for kelp, yeah. Can you clarify a little bit about what kind of rocks would be more successful to grow mm -hmm. kelp? Yeah, so the question is what kind of rocks are more successful for bull kelp? Well, bull kelp is not really that picky in terms of types of, of hard substrate that it'll settle on. I've picked up pieces of bull kelp that are settled on a tiny clamshell, and I've picked <laughs> up pieces of bull kelp that are on like tiny pebbles, and some that are on huge boulders. I think what's important is, is that the substrate is hard, and, uh, and if, if it's in a location where there's a lot of current, it needs to be big enough that the kelp will stay in place, otherwise the kelp will get transported elsewhere. Um, and you know it needs to be it needs to ha be occurring at a certain depth range for the kelp to really thrive. Sometimes we do see kelp bull kelp that'll appear like on a floating dock, but it typically doesn't really like go through its whole life cycle and and reach reproductive maturity. So I'm not sure if there's like specific um, you know types of rock that are better, but sort of any hard sub substrate that's in a suitable location will do it for bull kelp. I remember a lot of kelp that was at the southern end of Maury Island, and I don't see it mm -hmm. on your map at all. I've been on the island 70 years, so I have seen the dim diminished amount of kelp, and there's very little 
there now, but I don't see any evidence of, I know it was there 10 years ago, but. Yeah, 10 years ago, okay, cool. I mean, that, I mean that's great to know that there was a kelp forest there within the last 10 years off the south end of Maury Island, you said? Fascinating, yeah. Yeah, I think this the data set that I have is, you know, an older data set and I'm I think that it's probably has some gaps in it. So thank you. That's that's interesting to know. So you mentioned that they're commercial aquaculture uh, kelp farms. Mm -hmm. Are they raising kelp for food or fertilizer or what what is the commercial value of kelp? Sure, yeah, great question. So um, the one, the most active farm that's been in the water for a number of years now is Blue Dot Sea Farms, which is um, up at Hood Head, and they grow sugar kelp and bull kelp, but primarily sugar kelp for food products. Um, so if, I don't know if anybody's seen the chicharrones around. They're like a, <laughs> they're like a vegetarian chicharron that has kelp on like kelp seasoning on it and they have them at Mariners games now and stuff so that, that's what Blue Dot Sea Farms is producing is kelp for food. The other farm I think was just recently permitted so I'm not sure what stage of um, production they're in right now is, is up um, in Lego Bay um, around Lummi. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what they're producing. There is a big interest in using kelp for fertilizer as well. Um, it, there's a lot of work that shows that if fertilizer, oh, oh the other application from fertilizer is um, animal feed. So if kelp is added to animal feed or, or really any macroalgae, I think it can help reduce methane um, that are produced, like it can help reduce the methane in cow farts. So that's like a crazy application of kelp. <laughs> so that's that's some of the, the things, yeah, food products. It's used as a, alginate is used as like a thickener in a lot of um, food products and toothpaste and other sort of household products. Um, yeah, those agricultural things that I mentioned as well. Yeah, those are some of the commercial values of kelp. Yeah, thank you for your question. Interesting. Well, red algae does have an, an alternate life stage that's like a slick of dark red fuzz almost, so it could be that. Um, I'm not sure that, I don't... Awesome. Cool. Tar spot algae. Lovely. Yeah, I... I confess I'm really like a kelp fanatic myself and I don't know very much about the other kinds of algae. <laughs> so, tough question for me. <laughs> Thank you very much, audience member. <laughs> I was wondering if anybody's studying that mystery of the uh, reproductive part um, to find out how it's actually happening. And then, in addition to that, if anybody's studying the effects of nutrients on the juvenile sporophytes to find out if if that's a piece of the water chemistry that's out of balance? Yeah, yeah, um, so the question is about, you know, are people studying that alternate life uh, state, life phases and what's going on there, and then is anyone studying the effect of nutrients on the juveniles? Um, so in terms of the how the reproduction happens, I mean, we know how it happens in the lab, we just haven't observed in the field, so the real question is like, what stage is it overwintering in? Is it hanging out as a zoospore or as a gametophyte or as a juvenile sporophyte? So the seasonality of exactly when reproduction happens is the main question there, but the mechanics are pretty much understood. And then the question about, um, yeah, the effects of nutrients. Definitely in low nutrient conditions, which we sometimes see in the late summer after there have been um, big plankton blooms and the plankton will, will suck all the nutrients out of the water column so there isn't any available for kelp and then we see kelp really struggle. And there have been laboratory experiments. I think they might not be published yet because I, I'm just, I just know the folks who are working on them right now at UW, um, at, up at 
excuse me, up at FHL that in low nutrient conditions, kelp has a much harder time dealing with thermal stress. So that's definitely um, part of the problem, and I'm sure there'll be more published work about it coming out soon. Yeah, thanks for the question. That was great. Great. Well, thank you. Oh, well, let's take one more question, and then I think we can wrap it up, and we can have um, <coughs> Gray will be able to hang out in the lobby for a little bit longer along with Jackie, and you guys can um, ask personal questions. Well, <laughs> not very personal questions. You can ask your own <laughs> not questions. Not too personal, to I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I may have missed it, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are other threats that uh, you're concerned about to the kelp besides uh, temperature. Um, mm -hmm. You had mentioned at one point about uh, kelp crabs um, it sounded like cutting off the um, stalk of the kelp. So is there a big threat from that? And is that because the, the crabs have just exploded in their populations or something? Or what, what's, uh, what are the details on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the thing that I am, the question is about what are the, some of the other threats to kelp and are kelp crab and kelp crab grazing, is that a threat to kelp? Um, so yeah, temperature is definitely the thing that I am, am most concerned about and the interaction of these other things with the thermal stress on kelp. Um, in terms of the kelp crab, you know, they, they certainly are a grazer and they do have a huge obvious grazer impact on the kelp, especially in Central and South Sound and especially late in the season we see the kelp really start to, to tank and just become those big cables lying on the sea floor. What is not clear is if that's a problem, is if the kelp crabs are in, in some kind of population imbalance. Um, and that's, you know, we can't really answer that question because we don't have any historical information about kelp crab populations. So we don't know if they've like exploded all of a sudden. All we have is, is sort of, you know, that, that's a huge part of the reason of why we've launched this, this biological surveying initiative is to try to get information about questions just like that. Um, I think it's a. I think it's something to be concerned about kelp crab um, grazing. But I'm. I. It would shock me if it was the thing that was that was really driving kelp decline. I think it's quite possible that there's an interactive effect. That, for example, at high temperatures, kelp is less resistant to the grazing stress, and that could be a problem. But it would surprise me if it was the problem. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right, yeah, and thank you everybody so much. I really appreciate you coming out and <laughs> listening you, to me Gray. talk about kelp <laughs> and asking me all your fantastic questions. <laughs>